Our next speaker, another font of politically correct thought, is Tom DiLorenzo, a name I'm sure many of you are familiar with. You know, Tom is one of those rare minds where he's able to work at a very high academic level in two different disciplines, in economics and in history, which is, which is actually a remarkable achievement in and of itself. But in terms of, of his own life and his own courage, he's taken on two very powerful uh, uh, groups in America. He's taken on the Hamiltonian Federalists, who still plague us today in a million different guises. And of course, he's taken on the tremendous cult of Lincoln, which in academic circles is basically a firing squad. So for that, we commend him. And we're so glad to have Dr. Tom DiLorenzo with us today. Tom? Thank you all for coming, and uh, thanks to all the, the supporters of the Mises Institute, and also the future supporters who will donate before you leave today. That, that's a requirement, by the way. We are not going to let you out of the room, uh, uh, and, you, and you cannot have lunch either. Uh, and so, uh, well, you know, when, uh, when, with the worldwide collapse of socialism in the late 80s and early 90s, the Marxist left did not just throw in the towel. Uh, I remember at the time I was at the University of Tennessee and there was a Marxist uh, economist on the faculty and I ran into him in the parking lot right in the middle of all this happening with uh, Boris Yeltsin bombing the Russian parliament and things like that. And, uh, and I said, uh, John, what are you going to do now? Bricklayer? Carpenter? You know, what's, what's, what's the future for you? And he said, oh, no, 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 we're, we're stronger than ever now because we're no longer associated with all these bad guys, Ceausescu and Stalin and all that. And so, and, and so after, after all this, um, there are, uh, the, the Marxist left took uh, two different routes. You know, they, they didn't give up. One is they, they, uh, they paid attention to the socialist economist Robert Heilbrunner, who wrote an article in the New Yorker magazine in 1990, I think it was October 1990, in which he said, uh, yeah, socialism, uh, Mises was right. I, the, one of the articles he wrote was actually called, the title was Mises was right about socialism. And so you would think that meant give up on socialism, but but no, he said we need we need to work harder at it. We, you know because there, it, it always was about uh, totalitarian control. Uh, and so it never was about uh, helping the poor, or helping the laboring class, or anything like that. So it was always about control. And so how do we reassert our control over people's lives? He said, well, you know, socialism was always sold in the name of helping the people. And he, he essentially said, people schmeeple, the hell with the people. We're for the bugs and the ants and the snakes and, and all that stuff, the planet. So let's, let's sell socialism now in the name of saving the planet. And so, uh, and so hence, uh, the watermelons were born. The watermelons are green on the outside, red on the inside. And so there's a branch of the Marxist left that all became environmentalists all of a sudden. And they're promoting basically centrally planned economies under socialism under the guise of saving the planet. The other branch became cultural Marxists. They gave up on the old uh, class struggle between the working class and the, and the capitalist class, and they invented some new classes. There's the oppressor class and the oppressed class. The oppressors are white heterosexual males, and the oppressed class is everybody else pretty much, you know, the, the whole victim thing. And so, so that's a good way to, to, to uh, eliminate dissent and, and, and exert totalitarian control over society. And so we have those two classes. Now, I've been a, a university economics professor since 1979. I, I finished my PhD when I was 24, and I've been at it uh, ever since. And all for about the first 30 years of my career, Every August, the university administration, and I've taught at seven different universities, uh, the university administration would send out a memo about uh, what the average SAT score is of the incoming freshmen. And they would usually brag that it's up 10 points or something like that. And it would usually be accompanied by a promise that we're going to increase the standards uh, even more so that we'll have better qualified students. And of course, the faculty like this 
to, to hear this. And that went on for about 30 years of my career, you know, year in, year out, uh, the bragging about uh, how, you know, the higher SAT scores. And then about uh, six years ago, at my current employer, Loyola University, Maryland, they all of a sudden said, we're no longer requiring SAT scores at all as the entrance requirement. And they did away with them. And, uh, and the result of that, uh, I, I noticed uh, uh, it's been successful because in, in the website, the university website this year, in, in August, instead of, instead of giving us any information about the academic qualifications of the incoming freshman class, it said, the incoming freshman class is the di most diverse class in the history of the college. And so, so that's the objective. And so, so egalitarianism has become the new uh, secular religion in the, the academic seminaries where you send your children and grandchildren. And diversity, I think of the word diversity is, is basically some sort of quotas, is, is really, I call it the mating call of the academic administrators in, in today's world. Uh, when when the, the cultural Marxists took over my university about 10 years ago, the new president came in and he started giving the president's message, started saying things like uh, bemoaning the unequal distribution of resources around the world all of a sudden. And so, you know, from, from each according to his ability to each according to his need is his motto. His name is Brian Lenane. And, so, and his, uh, his academic vice president, who's the top academic officer of the university, when he had his first meeting with the business school faculty where, where I teach, he looked around the room and he said, there are too many people in here who look like me. Too many white guys, in other words. And the minority faculty were extremely uncomfortable about that. I was looking at my, my, my minority colleagues and they, well, they were like, didn't know where to hide. Because what, what he was basically saying was he was telling people like me, you don't really belong here because you're here because of white privilege. And also, he was telling the minority faculty, well, maybe you don't belong here either because you're here from affirmative action. You know, you don't really belong there. You know, and so, and so that, I think that's why, one of the reasons why they seem so, so uncomfortable. And so, and then he denounced, he announced that diversity would be his number one goal in his, you know, in his, his reign as academic vice, vice president. So that's become the sort of the number one objective of, of a lot of universities. Uh, you know, more than academics or learning, education, education, schmeducation is, is the attitude some of these people seem to have <clears throat> when they when they do that. That's why, I, and I, I did call it the mating call of academic administrators in an article on lourockwell.com referring to this guy. This is Tim Snyder is his name, Timothy Snyder. And uh, he's no longer the academic vice president of my university. He's, you know, he, he's done his thing. And so, so, and so silencing dissent is, is now praised and taught. It's taught to students and it's praised as the morally right thing to do. Uh, a lot of my students uh, are totally unaware of the case, the argument for free speech and academic freedom. And, and one of the, uh, one person who's responsible for this, and, and this, you know, this starts, really starts, I think, in, in the 60s, as, as a lot of bad things uh, st started in the 60s. And uh, there's an academic who's described on the, on the web uh, variously as the evangelist of cultural Marxism. He's also called a celebrated intellectual who taught at Harvard, Yale, and Columbia. His name is Herbert Marcuse, M-A-R-C-U-S-E. Uh, and he was, he's, he's really is sort of one of the gurus of political correctness among the, uh, the academic elite uh, that run today's, uh, most of today's universities in the United States. And uh, how did he become a celebrated intellectual? Well, uh, he wrote a 1955 book called Eros and Civilization, in which he advised young people the following, and I quote, don't work, have sex. And I guess it never occurred to him that the two things are not mutually exclusive uh, at all. But, but so, so it's, like, it's idiocy like this that makes you a celebrated intellectual at Harvard, I, I guess. And uh, he, he also denounced the scientific method in science. He said science and the scientific method are the enemy. He called it, quote, the enemy because, quote, it denies the reality of utopia. And by utopia... He meant communism. He was a communist. He was a, a, a self-described communist. 
And so, yeah, it denies the, re uh, the reality of, of communism, which sure does, uh, especially economic science. You know, Mises' great book, Socialism, explained that a, a long, long time ago. Uh, socialism could never work as an economic system, okay? He opposed freedom of speech and academic freedom for the same reason, that it produced too many criticisms of communism. You know, and so let's just shut everybody up about this and, and only give our students positive images of it. And it reminds me, at my university, I created a new course called Capitalism and Its Critics. It was my way of sneaking Austrian economics into the curriculum. And, and, uh, and it's been around, I've had it for about 10 years now, this, uh, uh, this, this course. And uh, I use one, you know, sometimes I've used the Communist Manifesto. You know, I, 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 give, I teach the students, here's what the bad guys have said, and then here's what Mises says about this or anything. So I go back and forth, here's what the environmental lunatics say, and here's, here's George Reisman over, over here, or something like that. And, uh, and so when I use the Communist Manifesto, I had a student tell me, you know, please, this is the fifth time I've been assigned the Communist Manifesto <laughs> at this university. But, but all, all his other professors in philosophy and history use it as sort of a roadmap to the future. You know, they, I use it as a historical artifact. And, uh, but but the, other, the other people said, you know, wouldn't it be nice if we had a society like this? This student told me what his philosophy professor said. And so, so too many criticisms. He also said this, there's no need for logic, debate, and free exchange of ideas for Marxism provides the answers. It reminds me of Al Gore's statement that there's settled science about global warming, you know. And I mean, the whole, the whole phrase of settled science is, is, is so anti-science, it's, it's, uh, it's unbelievable. I mean, there's nothing is ever settled in science because all these statistical studies are based on probabilities. You know, statistics is not, it's not physics, it's all based on probabilities and there's always a new hypothesis to come around the corner to question the established uh, view, viewpoint. That's how we progress in our learning. And so this whole idea that uh, science can never be totally settled uh, you know, is pretty dubious. Uh, it, you know, it is in, in some areas, you know, in physics especially, but, but not, not something like uh, the climate. Uh, and so, and so other views like conservative and libertarian views, the views of people like myself and Jeff and Tom Woods should not be tolerated on campus, Marcuse said, because they support the status quo. And, and this has led to the widespread belief in academe today in the United States that only the oppressed deserve tolerance and free speech and academic freedom. That's why when they wage these malicious and vicious campaigns of, of libel and slander against uh, campus speakers who, with whom they oppose, they think they're doing the morally righteous thing. You know, because, you know, if, if, if someone like me shows up at, uh, at an Ivy League school and, and they orga organize a protest or shout me down or the campus police have to, have to come in or some, you know, ruin the event, uh, they think that's the morally righteous thing uh, to do because uh, I'm a spokesman for the oppressor class and, uh, and I'm going to criticize the oppressed. And that was one of Marcuse's ideas. And he also said that students especially must be indoctrinated in this type of thinking that, that only the oppressed deserve free speech. That's how we can overturn the status quo. And I see all of this fully in place at, at so many American universities these days. That this, and this all comes from this, this character, Herbert Marcuse. Another person who I, I call the high priestess of cultural Marxism is a, a woman named Catherine McKinnon, who's a law professor at the University of Southern California. At least she was last time I looked her up on the web. I don't, who knows? Uh, we academics are so, sort, of, uh, a, sort of like nomads sometimes and skip around different places. And, uh, and she's known for the view that it has been embraced by a lot of universities that that dissenting views can create a hostile work environment. And if you create a hostile work environment for your coworkers that is so hostile that they are incapable of performing their job, then you can be fired. That's that's the new uh, the new new thing. And and uh, and I, I was told I was warned about this myself by Timothy Snyder, the academic vice president uh, I mentioned at the, at the beginning. 
uh, after uh, after the the president of my university maliciously libeled Walter Block, uh, my friend Walter Block, in a speech he gave at my university years ago. Uh, you know, I set up a meeting with Snyder to, to talk talk about this, and uh, and so and I you know in, in the meantime after Walter was uh, libeled, uh, which I'll explain it in a few minutes. Uh, what the university didn't understand was that one of my very good friends in Baltimore was a, the radio talk show host, the late Ron Smith, who had a three-hour talk show drive time, three to six every day, and it was broadcast all the way up to New York and Connecticut. You know, it was a big radio station, and Ron had Walter and me on for six hours, just just <laughs> lambasting and, and de destroying these people and uh, in, in their and in, in their their antics. And so, uh, so the academic vice president wanted to talk to me about this, and, and he he told me that all this was creating a hostile work environment, and, it, <laughs> and and I told him, and my response was that I'm the one who who now has the hostile work environment, and it's because of you. That's exactly exactly what I told him. You know, the, the day before this happened, I had a good work environment, but now, uh, you know, the the whole university, uh, the it was uh, you know, in an uproar over. Uh, Walter's uh, trivial comments that were blown up into something evil, but I'll explain that uh, in, in a little bit. And so, so dissenting views create a hostile work environment. So, essentially, what what she's saying is that you should teach your children: sticks and stones will break my bones, but names and words are even worse. So that's that's the new motto that we should that we should teach. And another trick that the academic bureaucrats use, and they use this at my uh, university during this whole fiasco with uh, Walter Block, was uh, to make grandiose speeches in, in, in favor of academic freedom. So they'll get the president or some, the academic vice president or somebody like that to make a speech or issue a, an article in the student newspaper about their everlasting devotion to academic freedom and free speech as they crush academic freedom and free speech among those who disagree with their extreme left-wing crazy views of political correctness. And, so, and they've developed the, uh, the tactic that no student should ever uh, hear anything that is insensitive or may hurt his or her feelings. Uh, it's the, the infantilization of college students is the business American universities are in these days as a result. Even the New York Times has protested this, if you can believe that. In, a, in a, an article on March 21st of this year in the New York Times was about some things that have been going on at Brown University. Brown University has, is one of the universities that has led the way in politically correct insanity. And what they do if a, if a, uh, if a controversial speaker is about to show up, you know, if, if God forbid Tom Woods would ever be invited to Brown University, this is what might happen. They set up what's called a safe room. Safe room. You go to this room and you can feel safe from, from Tom, from whatever Tom would, would have to say. Okay, and this is from the New York Times. I'm reading this. And what is in this safe room? So students can say, oh my God, Tom Woods is coming to campus. I better head for the safe room. Lock the door. <laughs> I'm not making this up. This is from the New York Times. There are cookies, cookies, coloring books, Play-Doh, <laughs> calming music, calming music, pillows, blankets, <laughs> videos of frolicking puppies. <laughs> she likes, she likes it. And uh, of course, trauma experts. They got trauma experts. So New York Times, uh, March 21st of this year, trauma experts. You know, just in case some dissenting views. And of course, uh, the faculty are now uh, taught that uh, if there's anything controversial on your syllabus, 
you know, the, the, the students are asked to read, put a trigger warning on it, you know, warning, warning, you might, this, you might, something might be insensitive here. If, uh, of course, this doesn't apply to all the left-wing claptrap that they read. You know, if you sign the Communist Manifesto or, or Das Kapital, these are, you don't need a trigger warning for that. That's, <laughs> what could be controversial about that? Nothing. And so, so the, so, and so the, and so the academic left has adopted all kinds of mascots and you can never criticize anything a mascot says or does. And, uh, and if, and if, and if anything that you say can be construed how, however remotely to be critical of one of the mascots, well, then you will be branded as a racist, a sexist, a homophobe, and on and on and on. Uh, those are, these are the tools of, of the libeler. And so, and you know, and you've all heard examples of this, I guess. Uh, you know, our friend Hans Hoppe, who uh, who uh, was mentioned earlier, uh, giving a, a lecture to an economics class at UNLV, where he taught for 20 years, and he was giving a, a lecture on uh, time preference, and he was giving examples of a high time preference of the type of people who don't save very much for the future and who spend a more of their money now. And he had a long list of the type of people that you might expect, uh, you know, elderly people who have already put their kids through school and so forth. They're not saving a lot anymore. Uh, people who never had children, uh, they're not saving for their children's education because they never had children, things like that. And he included homosexuals in there who don't have children. He said homosexuals with children, different, different group. And of course, the lesson was that there's nothing inherently good or bad about high time preference, low time preference. It's just your preference. And he was basically kicked out of UNLV for that. Some, some one student in the class went to the university administration and complained that it was insensitive to, to gay people to, to, to suggest that they might have a high time preference. <laughs> and so and it, it ended up uh, uh, you know, causing him great grief for an entire year. There was an international letter writing campaign on Hans's behalf. Even the Secretary of State of Italy wrote a letter to the U who Hans knows, wrote a letter to the UNLV administration telling them to, you know, cut it out. This is ridiculous. And, uh, but it didn't matter. It, it didn't matter. Uh, it was all, they, they, they wanted, they, they thought they could get him because of his economic views. Uh, this, this, this had nothing to do with what Hans said in that one class. You know, they were, they were out, you know, Murray Rothbard was gone by this time. He taught at UNLV also, but Hans was the one outlier. You know, they, he was the one dissenter that they, they just could not tolerate having him there. And with the Walter Block fiasco at my university, Walter gave a very mainstream talk on the economics of discrimination. It's a very simple theory. It says basically, if, say I'm a, if I'm a misogynist, I hate women, and I have, uh, and I have an accounting firm, and I have, I have a male and a female employee, and they can both create $100,000 a year for me in revenue with, with all their billing, so they're equally qualified, okay? I pay the man 90000 a year, and I pay the woman 50000 a year because I'm discriminating. Well, I create a profit opportunity for my competitors who can, who can hire the, women, the woman away at 60, and they still make a $40,000 a year profit because she can generate 100,000 in revenue. And then somebody else will hire her away at 70 or 80. And that's how competition in the marketplace dilutes the effect of discrimination. It, does, it doesn't eliminate it. You know, people have been discriminating against each other for thousands of years in one way or another, but that's how the market penalizes uh, racial discrimination or sex discrimination in the job place. That's all he said. And, and again, one student was sent there. It was all a setup. He was sent there to try to detect something insensitive. And so he went to the cultural Marxist gang on campus. Not me, I was the sponsor of the lecture. He went to the cultural Marxist gang and said it was insensitive, you know, what Walter Block was. And then, so the president of the university sent out an email to all faculty, staff, students, and alumni apologizing for the insensitive remark that was made, but he never said what the remark was uh, that was made. And so that's how they operate, that's how they operate. But, uh, but we, we, Walter and I, 
prevailed in the end. We went on the radio for six hours. We wrote dozens of articles on lourockwell.com, so much so that one of my students told me that the administration sent a memo to students saying, don't read do lourockwell.com. It's a, it's a hate speech uh, thing. And of course, that, that guaranteed that every single student would look up lourockwell.com, <laughs> didn't it? <laughs> so Lou probably has hundreds of additional readers as a, as a result of, uh, of, the, uh, of this. This, uh, well, the American Enterprise Institute sponsored a debate, a public debate on immigration policy. The Soviet Poverty Law Center, which some people call Southern Poverty Law Center, <laughs> although, although they don't practice law and they have a, a, an endowment of over $20 million, so they obviously don't help poor people either. Uh, they would give some of that away to poor people in Montgomery, where they're, Alabama, where they're, they're located. Uh, they, they, uh, they said that AEI was mainstreaming hate, you know, mainstreaming hate, by a debate. When a group of uh, police and military officers formed this group called Oath Keepers, and what's the oath? They said, well, we all take an oath to defend the Constitution, and uh, we're going to reaffirm that oath. That's it. That's all we're doing. They're a hate group. They lay, the Soviet Poverty Law Center labeled them a hate group. And the media and academe, by the way, they treat the Soviet Poverty Law Center like they treat the Pope. You know, they say, I have the greatest respect for these. They call it the Southern Poverty Law Center. And then they, they say they a, a hate group. They'll call Oath Keepers a hate group. When, uh, <clears throat> when Ron Paul was running for president, the Department of Homeland Security, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> Under, uh, the, under Jenna Napolitano, issued a statement, a press release, saying that uh, cars with a Ron Paul for President bumper sticker could be, could, uh, you could identify these people as likely terrorist threats. And that came from the Soviet Poverty Law Center. And, the, and of course, a big furor was, 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 uh, was dusted up over that. And so they backed off and rescinded that. They, they took that off the website of the uh, Department of Fatherland Security. <laughs> You know. And all of this is why Chris Rock and Jerry Seinfeld no longer perform their comedy acts on college campuses. They gave up on it. You know, these are humorless Stalinists that run the college campuses these days. And so there's no place for Chris Rock or uh, Jerry Seinfeld on there. Seinfeld even had some 20-year-old 20 20 -year nitwit write him a letter instructing him on the proper way to deliver comedy to an audience. If you can... <laughs> What, what kind of education did that, does that kid have to think that he had the, uh, the ability to l lecture uh, Jerry Seinfeld on comedy? Okay. Um, the final thing I want to say is, you know, I'll, you know preparing this talk, you know, I taught a course on, under the, the auspices of the Mises Academy several times on uh, Hayek's famous book, The Road to Serfdom. I, I first taught it uh, uh, after... Uh, Tom, Tom, and uh, Tom Woods and Yuri Maltsev, our friend Yuri Maltsev, appeared on uh, Glenn Beck's television show and talked about the road to serfdom. And, and Glenn Beck had such a big audience; it went to number one in sales on Amazon.com the next day. And so, like that very day, I put together a five-week online course on the road to serfdom. I thought it'd be very, very popular, and I, I taught it a few times. And uh, there's a chapter at, near the end of the road to serfdom called "The End of Truth." And there are some good nuggets there that Hayek wrote that I think are very, very telling and, and educational about uh, political correctness and the cultural Marxists that, that run the American universities. And so I'm going to read just a few of these things. Hayek wrote that totalitarian propaganda is destructive of all morals because it undermines one of the foundations of all morals, the sense of and the respect for the truth. You know, if, 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 we, if we quit searching for the truth with all this censorship, it, just, it doesn't just undermine the truth about whatever the subject is you're studying. It, it, it's destructive of all morals because it's destructive of the sense and respect for the truth. Another thing Hayek said that's relevant, I think, he said, in the disciplines dealing directly with human affairs and therefore most immediately affecting political views, such as history, law, or economics, the disinterested search for truth cannot be allowed in a totalitarian system. These disciplines have, in all totalitarian countries, become the most fertile factories for the official myths which the rulers use to guide the minds and wills of their subjects, official myths. 
And of course, that's one of the things the Mises Institute has been doing for, for 30 years, 30 some years now, is, is uh, abolishing and destroying a lot of these myths and, and searching for truth. That's one of the things that really attracted me to the Austrian school as a young student. <clears throat> I, was, I was forced to read Paul Samuelson and all of the mainstream Keynesians. And then I came across the Austrians. And it was even when I was 18, 19, 20 years old as a college student, it was, it was very apparent to me that there was a different approach here. I thought these mainstream guys, they're sort of just bragging about how much math they know and how much how confusing they can make the world seem. But the Austrians were very different. They were all, they had this relentless pursuit of the truth and they blended economics and history and philosophy and statistics and, and, and that. It was, it was very obvious to me. And so, and, so, and so that's why I've been associated with the Mises Institute for about almost, for about 30 years now, because that's the enterprise. It's, it's confronting these official myths and through economic education. And of course, we stand on some very big shoulders of, uh, of uh, von Mises and Hayek and Rothbard and, and, and others. Another thing Hayek said in The Road to Serfdom, he said, the word truth itself causes to have its, uh, ceases to have its old meaning. It describes no longer something to be found with the individual conscience as the sole arbiter of whether in any particular instance the evidence warrants a belief, it becomes something to be laid down by authority. Okay, it's laid down by authority, the politically correct way of thinking. You know, in the Walter Block case, for example, you know, why they, why they became incensed over Walter giving a very mainstream talk about the economics of discrimination. And by the way, Walter Block's dissertation chairman at Columbia many, many years ago was Gary Becker. And Gary Becker's doctoral dissertation at the University of Chicago was turned into a book called The Economics of Discrimination. So here's the second generation economics professor basically repeating what he was taught in graduate school 40 years earlier. Uh, and, and he was maliciously libeled uh, by a university president for, for it, okay? And so, uh, anyway, I just wanted to bring that point up. And the final thing that Hayek says is intolerance is openly extolled. As I said at the beginning, uh, and this is Hayek writing this in 1943. And so, and then Herbert Marcuse back in the 60s was saying, we should uh, uh, extol or praise intolerance. And, and that's exactly what has happened. Now, as far as, as, far as what can be done, uh, well, of course, speaking truth to power is what we do at the Mises Institute uh, in many ways uh, with our educational programs, especially with young people. And young people, students, uh, I think are, they are incensed as much as anybody is when they understand that they've been lied to, used as political pawns, miseducated, uh, they don't like it. And a lot of them sit back and tolerate all this political correctness. It's been my experience. But they know what's going on. <clears throat> a lot of them do. Not all of them are fooled by, the, by, uh, by this relentless uh, uh, drumbeat of, of political correctness at the universities. A lot of my students that I talk to, they laugh at it. They, they just, you know, it's another, another antique of the... Of the uh, of the campus socialists and, and th things like that. And so, so it's, it's not as hard as you would think to turn things around through education, uh, because uh, especially in economics, uh, even just one simple example, it's not only the left-wingers. I had one student who came to my American economic history class and he was, he was astounded. He said, I'm a, he said, I'm a senior economics major. I've taken all the economics courses except this one. And I never knew there were criticisms of the Fed that existed. You know, you know I've had money in banking, monetary theory, macroeconomics one, macroeconomics two. I didn't know there was criticisms of the Fed. And so, we, so, and he totally threw around. He came to Mises University and, 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 so, uh, and so he educated himself. Now, so we use economic education. Uh, economic education in, in Austrian economics is like, uh, to, in the academic world, is like flashing a Christian cross in front of Dracula. Uh, that's the way I've always looked at it. That's why Paul, even Paul Krugman gets so upset 
at, at some of the ideas of, of Austrian economics. You know, why should he get upset? He, uh, you know, he, he makes all this money. He's a New York Times columnist. He's a Columbia University professor now. Why should he get upset over uh, Tom, Tom Wood's book, Meltdown, about the, the Great Recession or, or anything uh, our friend Bob Murphy writes about, about business cycles or something like that? He does. Uh, the final uh, point I'll make about what can be done is ridicule. I mean, the story about the frolicking puppies at Brown University and things like that, uh, we need to ridicule these things these people are doing as much as humanly possible. Or Herbert Marcuse saying, well, you can, you can choose work or you can choose sex, but you can't have both. You know, I think we need, we need to ridicule a lot of what they're saying because it's very easy to ridicule that. And, uh, and that's been one of my uh, main occupations for a long time is, 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 uh, is ridicule of, of these, some of these bad ideas. So thank you very much for coming. I hope you have a good, uh, good afternoon.